The following program is an original production of WYCC PBS Chicago. Good evening. I'm Chris Bury. And I'm Barbara Pinto. Tonight, we take a closer look at women in politics. This November, nearly 70 women will be running for public office in Illinois. From mayor to the U.S. House and Senate, this city and state have long histories of electing strong female politicians. The path to public office is not easy, and it can be especially tough for women. Tonight, the status of women in politics, a look back and a look ahead. We represent more than 50% of the population, but we don't have more than 50% of the elected seats. Illinois State Representative Laura Fine, a first-term Democrat from Glenview, will be seeking re-election this fall. I think women really look at things from a different angle and add something to the political process that would otherwise be missing. Raised in Glenview, Fine felt compelled to run for a seat in the General Assembly following a family tragedy. Her husband nearly died in a head-on collision, losing his left arm in the crash. And all of a sudden you realize the rug can be pulled out from under you in a second and there's nothing you can do about it. Fine's husband spent five weeks in the hospital. The bill, half a million dollars. Their insurance company refused to pay. The Fines came close to selling their house and cashing in on their savings just to pay off the medical debt. It took seven months of wrangling and the threat of a lawsuit before the insurance company agreed to pay the bill. So for me, that was part of the reason that I wanted to run, because I didn't want this to happen to anybody else. Fine is among 41 women currently serving as state representatives in Springfield. Fifteen women are state senators. The Illinois Attorney General is a woman. So is the state controller and lieutenant governor. Unlike 36 other states, Illinois has not yet elected a female governor. Illinois now has four women serving in the U.S. House in Washington, none in the Senate. At Chicago City Hall, among the 50 aldermen, 16 are women. The city clerk is a woman, and so is the city treasurer. Women were not even allowed to vote in the U.S. until 1920. Rebecca Sive, author of the book entitled Every Day is Election Day, A Woman's Guide to Winning Any Office, calls this current era in politics the most significant since the women's suffrage movement. We have at least a half a dozen women being talked about on both sides of the aisle as you know, serious, qualified, well-qualified candidates for the presidency and the vice presidency. And that's never happened before. Illinois has a history of strong, colorful women in politics. Lottie Holman O'Neill was the first woman in the state legislature. Carol Mosley Braun was the first black female to serve in the U.S. Senate. And Jane Byrne was the first woman elected mayor of Chicago. Tomorrow we're going to make the West Side come alive again, okay? All the way. 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 Today, female movers and shakers in Illinois and Chicago politics include Attorney General Lisa Madigan, Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle, and the outspoken president of the Chicago's Teachers Union, Karen Lewis. I'm not looking to make anybody's election year easy at all. Obamacare is pretty much the thing that really did launch me into uh, running for political office. Sharon Brannigan is a small business owner running as a Republican for the U.S. Congress in the 3rd District. She and her husband run a flower shop in Orland Park. So your total with tax and delivery comes to 173.13. Brannigan says she's running because she feels as if nobody in Washington is listening to small business owners. Being a female, I think I have a little bit um, advantage now. You know, you, you come into this arena, they're not used to you. Well, now they're really paying attention. Women have come a long way since the suffrage movement. But according to author Rebecca Sive, the double standards still exist, with female candidates facing questions men would never have to answer. People were talking about whether uh, the fact that she had a grandchild, or impending grandchild, would mean that uh, Secretary Clinton wouldn't run for president. Joe Biden was not asked that question and won't be asked that question. 
This evening, we're joined by our panelists, Jan Schakowsky, U.S. Representative for the 9th Congressional District, Michael McEwen, President of McEwen and Associates, and Anne Lucine, law professor from the John Marshall Law School. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Congresswoman, do women still face a double standard? You know, I think when women run, women win, that actually women are doing very well right now as candidates. They're well accepted as candidates. Voters believe that women tend to be more honest, operate not in back rooms, are more transparent and collaborative. And um, I know that for Congress, uh, we've been recruiting more women than, than men to run for uh, the open seats and the competitive seats. So Michael, that double standards disappeared? It hasn't disappeared. To me, it's kind of like uh, Pogo, we met the enemy and it's us. Because the real thing now with the social networks and everything coming out and campaigns being hotter and you wind up being what you are, uh, the one thing that drives me crazy is I know good, strong women on both sides, uh, both parties, and you'll tell them to hit this issue, but they'll say, well, I can't be that shrill about it because I'll sound like the B word, okay? Well, politics is a rough game. The thing is, is, if you believe in what you say, the people will believe you. Sometimes the congresswoman says stuff that says, well, how'd you get away with that? Well, because she believes it. You can, you know, Bob Dylan said this thing, we all see the same thing, but from a different point of view. If you see what the problem is, maybe you've got a different solution than this one does. But you've got to believe the problem's there, and they've got to believe that you believe it. It's just that simple. Now, if women are seen, as you said, as more collaborative, as more honest, uh, why aren't there more of them in government? And is, is the problem part of the B word? Are we not leaning in, as, as Sheryl Sandberg said? Well, where's the disconnect here? Well, speaking as someone who's been a woman lawyer for almost 50 years ago, I'm familiar with the B word concept. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you think polit women politicians have a hard time try being a woman lawyer and not being <laughs> called the B word. But uh, I think things have changed enormously. But the main problem now is not uh, that women appear too strong, but so many women uh, lack self-confidence. Uh, they, it used to be that yep. they did not have role models. Now they have wonderful role models with people like con the congresswoman here. But it's, there's still, I think, another 10 years or so before a lot of women say, you know, I could do that. I want to get out there and run for office. You know, when they say that, they usually say, as the uh, lady with the business said, I want to do something. I have a real reason for doing this. What about the public, Congresswoman? Have you seen in your career a, a change in the attitudes of public toward women candidates? Absolutely. And that's why when you say, why aren't there more women? Because more women aren't running. And I have to agree, a study was done of 1,000 qualified men and 1,000 qualified women. And each group was asked, are you qualified to run for public office? The women about themselves were twice as likely to say, no, I'm not qualified. Yeah. Um, and we are still working to overcome that. Women, I've talked to so many women um, that say, oh, I'd rather be in the background. I, Lack I will Lack of confidence? Help. Lack of confidence? It's a, Yes, I believe that it is a lack of confidence, a lack of sense that I know enough, I'm smart enough, and sometimes it's a lack of valuing their own experiences. Yep. Um, it, it could, you know, fortunately, we have a couple of women in the Congress now that themselves have actually been on food stamps, on the SNAP program. Yeah. You know, it's really important that they're at the table when we have discussions about what do we fund and what are the priorities. These kinds of experiences. Um, you may have been a, uh, a Cub Scout leader as a, as a mom, uh, organizing um, different kinds of things, not just businesses. Although small businesses now, many of them are run by women. So w women want to be asked. That's why almost every event I go to, I end with, and I am asking, any of you who are even dreaming about remotely running for, for office to run, Do and it. I will help you. Midterm elections are coming up, and women voters are going to play a very key role in electing the next Congress. And a new poll by the Wall Street Journal and NBC News offers some mixed signals. In general, 
49% of female voters prefer a Democratic Congress. 39% would rather have Republicans in charge. But Caucasian women are more likely than others to vote Republican. According to the same poll, 58% of white women disapprove of President Obama's economic record, and they are often an important barometer in midterm elections. And does that bode poorly for the Democrats this fall? They may say that to a poll, but when they are faced with two choices in the booth, I think they may uh, vote rather differently. I'm not sure how they will vote, but I'm, excuse me, I'm not always uh, enamored of what polls will say this far ahead of an election especially. That's, that's the pollster here. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing is, is that I agree with you. Uh, one of the things, one of the problems that women have in politics and in getting to your thing uh, about wh how they're going to vote, uh, there's a whole new voting block out there that they just don't seem to track yet, which we're tracking, is, is, is what I call information libertarians. Most of these people under 40, women, men, collect data, determine what's best for them, and that's how they vote. They don't really care about, you know, they get all this information on blogs and everything else. But one of the main problems that women have is they do this polling where, these, where the media people say, well, here's what women should look like. Let's test on these issues, and, you know, this is what you say. And that's not what they are. You know, it, it's nice for them because they got this little caricature of what a woman's supposed yeah. to be and how to run the advertisements, but they don't let them breathe. They don't let them be what they are. And, and that's the problem it is, is, you know, when you run for any office, you're supposed to be a problem solver. You know, that's what it is. You permit your resume out there and the people in your district hire to see if you're doing the job or not. If not, I don't care about you. They'll throw you out. No, no problem. But it's a lot of the media consultants, they have this idea of what a woman should run. Like they'll ask us to test, well, test on this thing, test on this thing, test on this thing. And what you want to test on what's there, see how they are, see how they view it, see how their strengths are, and let them go out and enunciate it. And most of these polls are garbage anyhow. <laughs> I mean, they really are. Actually, what we have found when you want to distinguish among women, it's not so much race, it's whether or not they are married. Unmarried women seem to be a very important cohort oh. for the Democrats. 67% of unmarried women voted for Barack Obama over Mitt Romney in 2012. The question for 2014 is about turnout. Um, in yeah. 2010, there were about 50 million unmarried women and about 40% of them were unregistered. And you saw how badly the, the Democrats did. So the question now is, are we going to uh, be able to appeal to those women who are often in, uh, making less money than, either, than, than married or unmarried men and married women, uh, and are struggling more um, and want to hear from politicians that they are heard? You heard that from the small business woman. So anyway, it's about turnout. So you think a low, a low out? turnout is going to hurt Democrats, is what you're saying? Low turnout is going to hurt Democrats, particularly because the demographics, uh, the people who tend not to show up, young people, minority voters, and unmarried women um, tend not to turn out more in the midterm elections. So we have to get them out. And what messages does that population respond to? I mean, when you look at the issues and you look at the gender gap and the people who do get out to vote on certain issues or for certain candidates, where do you focus to target those individuals? We've been, we've been very carefully looking at that. Um, the, under the leadership of Nancy Pelosi, we've launched a campaign called An Economic Agenda, When Women Succeed, America Succeeds. We're about to take it on the road on a, on a, on a bus tour. We're talking about equal pay. It is 2014. Women are paid 77 cents. Minority women even less on the dollar that, that men make. They're interested in, in, in child care, and they're interested in work-life balance. Things like two-thirds of minimum wage workers are women, and many of them, most of them, get not a single paid day off work. That was identified as the most important thing that they want. And so we're going to be taking that on, on the road. Raise the minimum wage, give paid leave, um, have affordable childcare.
But, Anne, the poll data doesn't necessarily support the Democrats in that because there is this great unease about those economic issues. And as we saw in the poll, President Obama is not getting a strong rating from women on the performance of the economy. That is true, but in the immortal words of uh, an old Chicago politician, you can't beat somebody with nobody. And I always say it's a question of what's going to happen when they get into the booth. For whom else are they going to vote? They may be mad at Obama, they may be mad at their current congressman, but for whom are they going to vote? I think the congresswoman is absolutely right. A voter turnout is the key. And I don't know who's going to be voting in November. Maybe the pollster does. Yeah, uh, the, who's going to be voting in November, it's interesting, uh, is that one of the byproducts of the information age is people now, we've been doing stuff with this for a while, is they form these information groups. In other words, uh, before, you know, you'd, there were all kinds of different things you'd talk about and think about. Now today, like Schwinn Bikes, if you're interested in Schwinn Bikes, you can go on Schwinn Bike websites and stay there all day and never, ever get out of it. What that is, is what happens is you exclude all the information. Now, what, and then what happens is, is these people are always looking for issues and agendas that affect Schwinn Bikes. <laughs> So, I mean, literally, yeah, and, uh, and the, the thing truth. is, what you've got is, is you've got these, what you have to do today is put these interest groups blocks together that may be very diverse, but you're not going to reach them otherwise. I mean, you can run every commercial you want. You're never going to touch these people. And the people that are energized to vote are the people who have agendas. One of the th other things that women is, particularly under 40, is their jobs are so transient. They move from place to place and everything else like that. So consequently, they want structure that's going to help them because they move from place to place. The, the, the job market doesn't exist. It existed 10, 15 years ago. And so people under 40, they get all this information. They stay in these information groups. And if you hit them, look them out. If you don't, you won't. That's just like the, uh, uh, you talk about turnout. A classic example in the governor's race. Uh, I said any three of them can win at the end. I said, if it's 600, and the Republican, if it's 650,000, Brady will win. He's got the best pace. If it's 750,000, then you know, Romney's going to win pretty easy. If it's over 800,000, Dillard's got a shot because that meant the union people were coming over there. And that's exactly what it was. You know, so turnout is everything. But turnout now is finding these groups and put them together. Politics is far more of a mosaic now than it is a big picture thing. And that's what you've got to do. All right, we're going to switch gears here for a quick second. An event hosted by the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, a panel of prominent women gathered to discuss the state of women in politics in America. Among the hot topics, whether women in other careers are as likely as men to take the leap into politics. Women insist on being prepared for the job, and men, in my experience, just kind of leap in and figure, say they'll figure it out later. And, you know, the women I've worked for, you know, they started in the state Senate and then they went to the Congress and then they ran for Senate. So by the time they have the job, they're really ready. Guys just say, hey, I think I'll be a senator. That'd be fun. And they go for it. And we don't have that many women who start right up there. And that, you know, means the women who are in the Senate and who are at that top level and governors, they're prepared and do a hell of a job. But there, that's another reason that the pool's a little smaller. The point there from Mandy Grunwald, Congresswoman, is that women are reluctant to take that plunge. Why do you suppose that is? I, I do think that it's a, a, a lack of self-confidence, one, if they are interested. But the other is I think that um, the atmosphere has become so toxic. Um, you see people fighting with each other all the time. People ask me, how can you stand it? I say, I am blessed with not being conflict-averse. And, and I think that that comes actually more easily to men than, than it does to women. And as Anna, I think you said, it's, this is a tough game. It's very you, tough. You, you know, you, you, you've got to do it. But there are plenty of tough women. I'm on a hunt for them um, that, <laughs> yeah. that, are, that are willing to do that. And, and, um, and, and you said to people, people hear authenticity. And they believe, and, and I think women tend to bring to politics more of that authenticity. So women, uh, in all the studies that are done, are viewed as really credible candidates. So I'm trying to convince women to have the confidence, you'll have the support, 
and just go for it. Well, when, it when, the, when Mandy talked about the difference between women and men, I mean, is this fearlessness or is there bias involved here? Does the, pop, the population at large think that a woman should have a larger resume? Well, le let me just say that, th that a poll was done by ABC Fusion last year and asked Democrats and Republicans, do you think there should be more women in Congress? 23% that it would be beneficial. 23% of Republicans said yes. 60% of Democrats said yes, that there, it would be beneficial to have more women in Congress. So, it, and we do, by the way. Um, we have 60 women in the House, Democratic women, and 19 Republican women in the House. So the balance is really skewed. But And the point that was uh, being made there by Mandy Grunwald, the political advisor, is that women are more content to stay in the House and, and stay in the Senate and without jumping in from another career into politics, whether it's business or law. Why do you suppose that is? Why that reluctance to get into the fray from something other than politics? I really don't know. It's probably easier, frankly, for women lawyers because we're already so used to being in a very combative kind of profession. I would bet that that is the s now, not used to be, but now would be the single greatest uh, profession for women who go into politics. I'll bet an enormous number of them have actually gone to law school. And that's only been in recent years that they've gone to law school. So I think we're, we're going to start seeing a change now where more and more women go from one profession than into politics. Well, actually, I mean, the, the route I think that's most common um, it has been coming from the state legislature yes. or, from, or from local government. Since 1981, Democrats have increased sixfold the number of women that are in state legislatures, and Republicans only have grown about 3%. Yeah. So it's also a question of a bench. Do you have people who are ready to move up? And of course, states like California, where there's term limits, women begin aspiring to, uh, to, to there's pressure upward for people to run, women in particular. The, the, uh, the uh, delegation of women from California is more than half, the, uh, the, the delegation of members from California, more than half women now. Congresswoman, did you, were you gung-ho when you first ran for the House, or did you have reservations about you know, whether you were qualified or what kind of personal conversation did you have in your head when you made the well, decision? Well, the fact that I came from the state legislature, it's really helpful, I think. Um, it was a pretty smooth, smooth transition. And when I ran, it was kind of a once-in-a-lifetime thing. I replaced the great Congressman Sidney Yates, who was elected in 1948. <laughs> I ran in 1998. <laughs> so it was like who won the Democratic primary was probably going to be there uh -huh. for, for quite a while. Um, I, was, uh, I was absolutely ready to go. Switch gears once again. Historically, a lack of campaign funding has been a major obstacle to women getting involved in politics. Money. Money is still a very big problem. Uh, I think across the board, uh, the opportunity, women are more reluctant to raise money. Once you get to the higher echelons, like the Senate re-election or obviously Mrs. Clinton's campaign, that's in a different arena. But I think in the legislative and the local races, it's still difficult. Money is difficult, and also the process sometimes um, is still dominated by men in terms of how uh, the process comes to pass. I disagree. <laughs> yeah. I disagree. I look around at the um, fundraisers, many, many women. Um, the, the director of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, uh, a woman, my fun, fundraiser is a, is a woman. I see that all over the country. Women are raising as much money as men are. They may not start with the same connections. That is a, that is a fact. Um, if they come from the business sector or they, uh, fewer self-funders are women. There's a great businesswoman running for Governor Mary Burke in um, Wisconsin right now um, who has uh, resources, she has business connections. So I think you're seeing more and more that women are on an even playing field when it comes to the men in terms of fundraising. And if, if they are on an even playing field, Mike, when it comes to, to, to money, is that going to just naturally uh, increase the numbers of women into politics? See, I, don't, I, I think that money is a fading influence in politics because the thing is, is you've got the 24-hour day news cycle. You still need money, though. You still huh? need money to run nah. a campaign. Well, well if, if you need money so much, 
then why did Romner spend so much and get so little? The fact of the matter is, what we track on, where they're getting their information from, again, it goes back to these information groups. They get, if, if they're interested in voting, uh, you can bet, uh, Carol Moran asked me, she says, well, you know, how can my columns stay relevant and interesting, you know, and that stuff? I said, well, you have to write what you want to write, because what they're going to do, anybody who's going to vote these days, I'll guarantee you, is going to read what they see in, in Carol's column, then maybe they'll go to a blog to see what that is, you know. It's the interest. The thing is, if you don't have any interest, there's no interest at all. Uh, one of the things we do with our polling is we do a 1 to 10 scale, a scale of 1 to 10, how likely is it you're going to vote, okay? And the thing is, over the years, it used to be that, that you know, you'd look at the fives and sixes and sevens and eights and nines and tens. Now we only look at the tens because they're the only ones that are going to vote. Unless you have interest in politics or an agenda, yeah. you're not going to pay any attention. And consequently, Forgive what me, you let, do, let me bring Ann into the conversation here just yeah. a little bit. Like, sorry, what about that point of, of the I fundraising think Mike for is women? is absolutely right. Historically, women have had a terrible time fundraising. I'm glad to hear that the parties have actually decided they're going to support their women candidates mm -hmm. and their men candidates financially. But I see this a lot with the young people I work with. They are on the Internet all the time, yeah. even when I don't want them to be on the Internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they are... I can't believe it. It's a generational thing. They're getting all of their information from basically from computers. But, but I, I, I want to say, to say that money has less influence in, in politics, given the decisions of the That's Supreme cool. Court now, that have made it possible for Sheldon Adelson to uh, hold what was called the Adelson primary. This is the casino owner, just so That's people right. know. That's uh, yeah. right. A multi-billionaire in Las Vegas where candidates went and presented themselves not to the public, to try and garner votes to one person because they know that he could give up to, what, $100 million? I don't know. And now yeah. all bets are, are, are off. I think the influence of money in, in politics really is, is toxic. I don't think it means that women, women can't win by any means and that we can't raise the, the money. But in general, for our democracy to have a handful of individuals who can play such a pivotal role in elections, I think it's, a, I think it's really unfortunate. We've got to get rid of that, I think. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. We're yeah. out of time. That wraps up our special presentation of In the Loop. We'd like to thank our guests, Jan Schakowsky, Michael McEwen, and Professor Ann Lucine. Until next time, I'm Barbara Pinto. And I'm Chris Bury. Good night. Good night.